Welcome to Breaking News with Ben Hunt, Jack Forehand, and Matt Ziegler. Before we start, let me remind you what the show is not. Breaking News is not a show about fact-checking. Breaking News is not a show about saying whose bias is the one and only correct bias. And Breaking News is definitely not a show about calling out fake news. Breaking News is a show where we look at today's top stories and have a conversation around our favorite critical question, why am I reading this now? Drawing on the headlines we're tracking at fiatnews.com, join us as we talk about what's collectively making us tick with clear eyes, full hearts, and this obligatory disclaimer. Nothing in this podcast is advising you to buy or sell any security or to do anything with your money. Seriously, you should only act on investment advice from someone you know and someone who knows your unique situation. We are not that person. Hi, and welcome back to Breaking News, where the headlines aren't the news, but the narratives and nudges, they're the stories that we're here to discuss. I'm joined, as always, by Jack Forehand and Ben Hunt. Wave hello, guys. Hello, Glad to guys. Be back. In this episode today, we are talking about, we've got the zeitgeist, and we're going to talk about the university presidents and why during this congressional testimony, they dodged this direct answer to uh, if calls for genocide would be harassment per their codes of conduct, which is nuts. Jack, you've got a dumb question about if it's a good idea to listen to dumb people sometimes. And there's something about Tucker Carlson on All In and... I mean, considering my own podcast feed, this is one of those things that I'm really excited for you to ask. Uh, we have our tweet of the week, which is Biden and the inflation data and what he just sent out. We've got a mailbag question from the Epsilon Theory forums about the culture of overwork in finance and probably in business in gen general. And that goes back to this gender question and then expands more broadly. I've got a cultish corner about forming complete thoughts and leveraging lessons from all of this stuff. Uh, and then we'll do the episode summary at the end. But, but first, the big picture topic of this week, Ben, you wrote a piece called The Changing Narrative of Women in Wall Street. And before anybody tunes out on three cis white dudes talking about gender and finance, let's be clear, this is about the narrative of Wall Street careers and about how it's depicted in media and how that narrative has been evolving in recent years. And what jumped out, out at me right away when I read this piece and immediately was compelled to forward this along to other professionals across, uh, just across industries is that this is a piece about the stories we tell about risk takers in general. So Ben, start us here. Can you define as you did in the piece, what, what a risk taker is and why do stories about risk takers matter so, so much? Sure, Matt. So risk taker has a, has a pretty specific meaning in finance because it, it doesn't mean what we colloquially think, or at least I colloquially think a risk taker is, I mean, a risk taker is somebody who runs a red light, right? Or, uh, Somebody says, oh, I'm going to put it all on black at the roulette table. A risk taker in finance jargon means somebody responsible for other people's money, typically, who puts the money at risk. Doesn't mean high risk. It means I'm going to try to get a return for you. I want to do something discretionary. I've got an idea. I'm a trader. I'm a portfolio manager. I'm an analyst who thinks this is what you should do. I'm an investment banker. I'm an advisor who says this is how we should allocate your money. That's what a risk taker means. It means putting money at risk doesn't mean high risk. And I, and I think that it was important to define that because what I was trying to do in this note as an observer of narrative, was try to see, well, how are women risk takers in that finance sense? How are they portrayed out of Hollywood, right? Movies, television shows, just how are they portrayed? That's what the note is about. Before we dig into it a little bit, I wanted to ask you about the whole idea of, of us talking about this, because you mentioned the piece that, you know, when, when you were originally asked to give a speech on this topic, you were kind of reluctant to do it. And that was the same thing I was saying to you 
before we started recording, like I had this feeling of like, you know, does anyone care about my opinion on this? Should I have an opinion on this? Like, like, how do you think through that? Yeah, it's a great question, Jack. So I, I, I was asked to give a keynote talk at, you know, it was just a prescription for disaster at a, at a uh, conference for, for women, for women risk takers, portfolio managers who are trying to connect with institutional sources of capital investors in their, in their funds. It's a, a program. It's a group run by a, called a hundred women of wall street. They've been doing this for over 10 years now. And it was like, I, I tried five ways to turn the invitation down. I said, look, I, this, the, the, it just doesn't feel right. I, I mean, what do you want, you know, a 59 year old finance bro, you know, giving a talk to women and they just, it just, it just seemed all wrong to me. But the, the invitation came because, uh, some of the organizers of the conference had, had heard a talk that I'd given about the role of storytelling in our lives, the role of narratives. And when I started working on this topic, what, what came to me is that there's no way I'm going to give a talk about my opinion about women on Wall Street or the obstacles they have or what, 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 I mean, who cares, right? But what I decided I could do and could do, I think, if not uniquely, I think uh, especially well, is present observations right? Not opinions, not try to give, oh, well, you know, when I've interviewed women, I, it's, yeah, come on. But I, I, I do have, I think, expertise quite separate from my age, quite separate from my Y chromosome at evaluating narratives, the way in which, in this case, women, female risk takers have been portrayed by Hollywood. So by keeping that as my sole focus and not allowing myself to, or as much as I can, not allow myself to get, you know, into the, the ego thing of, well, let me, let me tell you a thing or two. I, 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 I thought I was able to find some ground that I could stand on, um, to make it, to make it a, a, a meaningful experience for, for, for the audience. Yeah. Getting into this idea of how women are depicted, you delineated in the article between pre 2016 and post 2016. And, you know, I had a pretty good idea that women were not depicted as risk takers in movies, just from right. seeing movies, but I didn't have an idea to the degree it is. And so you wrote in the article, there's not one female portfolio. This is pre 2016. There's not one female portfolio manager or trader or allocator or analyst or investment banker someone whose job is to put other people's money at risk in any dramatic movie or television series prior to 2016, of which I am aware. Yeah. And that's pretty crazy. It is crazy. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, one thing that's interesting to me is that there aren't a lot of movies or TV shows uh, about Wall Street, period. Right? I mean, you've got the, the, really the first one in kind of modern context is, in fact, Wall Street. Right. Kirk Douglas, Charlie Sheen, Oliver Stone directed. Um, that's 1988, I think. I mean. And we got Greed is it. Good and a bunch of jokes, right? Right. That's, that's all anybody remembers of that movie. Right. It's still a right. great movie, but. Yeah, yeah. And I want to come back to Wall Street, though, ultimately, yeah. because they're. The, the movies that I think have had a lasting impact about Wall Street, period have a dramatic tension for the protagonist in Wall Street is the Charlie Sheen character that they are seduced, they are corrupted by Wall Street. And I want to come back to that idea. But for now, let's just say there are no dramas where women have any role as a um, risk taker in Wall Street. 
Margin Call, 2011. Uh, Demi Moore has a role there. She's the chief risk officer, kind of the, in this context, the opposite of risk taking. Um, and of course, she's the scapegoat for all the bad things that happen uh, to the to the bank in in Margin Call, which is, I think, the best Wall Street movie that that that's been made. H- hands down, highlighter, just yeah. because that's the only one that figured out the entire story was status transactions, not financial transactions. Hundred percent. One, one of my favorite movies. Full stop. It's um, it, it's both got some amazing scenes, and it's the, the the whole film's the whole film's absolutely worth seeing. That movie as well. The underlying story narrative is about the corruption or seduction uh, of Wall Street for otherwise, you know, well-meaning, good-intentioned people. There are two comedies before 2016 that portray women as risk takers. One of them we can dismiss as a farce called The Associate. It's Whoopi Goldberg as Whoopi Goldberg, uh, um, and it, which is fine, um, but it's not, it's not about Wall Street. Working Girl is about Wall Street. Working Girl... Tremendously well-received movie. Uh, I mean, nominated for six Academy Awards, including the Sigourney Weaver character. She was nominated for Best Supporting Actress for her role as the villainous boss of uh, Melanie Griffiths, the plucky secretary. That's what we called him in 1988. Uh, The plucky secretary who learned that if she puts on a pair of glasses to look serious. If she gets a better haircut, changes her wardrobe, why then she too can win the pick me contest with Harrison Ford. And ultimately find a more satisfying career away from Wall Street. It's, it's a profoundly, I will say, anti-feminist movie. And it was responsible for what I think is, was the, the dominant narrative, which is that women, they're not really cut out to be risk takers. You saw this in, in movies about gambling as well. So, you know, risk taking was perceived as, oh, it's like playing poker. And sorry, women just aren't cut out for that. You know, you've got to make a lot of fast decisions that have math in them. That's that's not for women. But if you do see a woman in one of those positions, like the Sigourney Weaver character, well, she must be a monster. She must be a monster. And, and I, I, I really believe that was the dominant, you know, it was the common knowledge. What we all knew, that we all knew about women in Wall Street. They can't do it. Or they're not, they're not really cut out for the job. And if they are, well, they're probably a monster. That, that was all we had. That was, that was it. That was all there was pre-2016. And what did you see in the post-2016 period? What did you see that changed? Well, 2016 is, a, is the demarcation line because that's when this movie called Equity was released. A movie written by women, three women. Uh, produced by a woman, one of the authors, uh, starring women, including two of the writers, uh, and directed by a woman. Yeah. Trifecta plus one. It's a good, I'll call it little movie. And I mean little in a non-pejorative sense. The movie did $1.7 million in box office. I, I, that's one million seven hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> I saw it on an airplane. Um, you know, I've had some feedback from other people seeing the movie, and so far we've all seen it on an airplane. I'm convinced it got so much more, you know, play there. I'm not than flying enough in... to have seen this movie yet, apparently. <laughs> right? Okay. So, Equity is about a female risk taker 
an investment banker working in IPO. It's about her friend, a female uh, prosecutor, federal prosecutor, and about her, her junior, her associate on the deal team. That's it. It's a story of three women, two of whom are risk takers in the financial sense, and, you know, a plot of what happens to them. That's it. Post this movie, Equity, you got shows like Billions, uh, which was also started in 2016. Uh, ran just through this year, through 2023. And I guess I think it was the second season. They introduced a uh, non-binary but coded female uh, character played by Asia Kate Dillon. Fantastically written character, I think. We can come back to that if you like. Uh, two years later, they, they introduced another reasonably prominent character, uh, an analyst uh, named Ryan, uh, played by Eva Victor. Uh, to be clear, right, so going back to the question, what's a risk taker? If you're a lawyer, you're not a risk taker. If you're a performance coach slash shrink, like, you know, one of the main characters on Billions, you're not a risk taker. So when I'm all this analysis, we're, we're, we're talking about how are women who take risks with other people, other people's money, how are they portrayed? And those are two, I think, full-fledged, well-written characters. And what's most notable about them, and this is the same with the characters in Equity, is that there's no longer this presence that, that women can't do the job. There's none of this, oh, golly, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep up with these men and their fast-paced decision-making. There's none of that crap. None of it. Um, 2020, I think it was, the, the, this uh, Brit HBO series called uh, Industry came out. Uh, it's got, I mean, the two most prominent roles there are young, junior, um, but female risk takers. This year, there's a movie called Fair Play. It actually just came out a few months ago. It's about a, uh, a woman getting a promotion at her hedge fund into a, in a, at a, to a portfolio manager role above her boyfriend. And uh, it's a very interesting movie. So since 2016, with the introduction of equity, we've had fully formed, I think very well-written, female, non-binary, coded female characters um, that can do the job, that can absolutely do the job. But there's a twist. <laughs> but there's a twist. So let's, let's, let's go to the, the twist because yeah. I, I, and I think this is where it's important. There's on one level, we're talking about the importance of visibility in these roles on the screen, in storytelling, the main character as we see them. And then there's there's the meta developmental level, which we won't go into for sake of this conversation today, but it's also important, I think, to acknowledge that there's like the metaphorical side of these things too. And we're focusing on it in finance, but we're seeing it in all sorts of areas too. We saw, we've been watching the Disney princesses go through their own version Absolutely. of this in yeah. the last 10 plus years. And that's really interesting. So there's the power of, saying, let's make this visible and put this front and center. But then there's also this thing with like the characters of the risk takers and how we view, right. What's a win. And right. you, you threw these, you threw out these three examples and I'm going to, I'm going to read a short version of each of these. Cause sure. I think we just got to talk about this too. Cause where this lands is, this is where I was reading this piece and you kept like, I'd have this idea. And then like a paragraph later, you'd hit the idea. So. I love when that happens. That's true. Um, you said three things that bug you. Number one, it nudges young women to choose a non-Wall Street risk-taking career in ways that young men are not similarly judged. Number two, it nudges the rest of the risk-taking financial world, i.e. men, to doubt the women who make the choice to pursue success as investment risk-takers. And number three, it nudges the women who make the choice to pursue success as an investment risk-taker to doubt themselves. And you go on for there. Yep. Talk, talk for a moment about 
this idea that narratives, even in this sense, post 2016, post 2020, still have these like underlying nudges of self doubt. Yeah. So remember I was talking about how in uh, Wall Street, the core narrative arc is Charlie Sheen is corrupted by Wall Street. Uh, and some late uh, margin call from 2011. Characters are corrupted, end up staying, right, for the money. Well, two things I'd say about that. First of all, there are other characters, male characters. Remember, there are no women characters. There are no female characters, risk takers in any of these movies. There are male characters who are not, you know, seduced by money, who, who are able to find a satisfying personal and professional career as risk takers. Harrison Ford and working. These movies and television shows, 2016 forward, they do now show women can do the job. But the unmistakable message of all these shows is that they shouldn't. Every one of these female characters is presented as either a tragedy of Wall Street corrupting them, that money triumphs their, their choice. This is important. They make a choice to pursue money over virtue, over being a good person. They make a choice of money over their own souls. And it's a choice that either defines them or a choice that they narrowly, luckily escape. Without exception. Similarly, since 2011, there have been no male characters who have been faced with this choice. Right? It's, 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 yes, women are now portrayed as being able to do the job, but you shouldn't. And that message and its universal application to women, it's not being presented at all for men, leads to those three conclusions that I you know, listed there. The first is, and I say this is my own daughters, right? We talk about, you know, they're in college, and well, what do you think about a career at Wall Street? I mean, it, it's, it's exciting. There is an intrinsic um, juice to it, to, to, to playing these games and making these decisions. There's an extrinsic good you're doing. There really is. By helping people with their money. And it's like, oh, no way. That's not for me. No way. Any other thing you want to suggest, they'll go, that, you know, it's kind of interesting. And you can't tell me that the fact that they've seen hundreds of portrayals of personally and professionally successful women in all these other fields, medicine, law, science, law enforcement, you know, yeah, join the FBI. Oh, that sounds interesting, right? Join an investment bank. Are you kidding? Oh, that's just, that, that'll be horrible. That's number one. It, it really does. I, I am, I'm convinced of it. Nudge young women not to enter the field of finance. Aspect number two, it absolutely impacts all of us, i.e. the guys who are in this field. This, this conference, woman comes in, and I, I, I can, I know these conversations, these internal conversations are happening because I hear guys talk about them. Oh, well, congratulations on being a portfolio manager of this fund. Wow, you, you must have made a lot of sacrifices. And the internal monologue is, yeah, and I bet your family made a lot of sacrifices too. If you even have a family. Yeah, you know, I promise you those internal dialogues are happening in our industry right now. And it comes, I think, or at least it is accentuated by, look, the media doesn't create our narratives, it reflects them, 
and it creates them. It goes back and forth. But the, but the third impact, Matt, to what you were describing there, and I think it's the most pernicious, these narratives change the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. And, and here I, I call it the Nate phenomenon after the boyfriend in The Devil Wears Prada. Which is the one you beat me to, because I thought for sure in an investment piece, I was like, this is The Devil Wears Prada over and over again in this story. And yep. then you took it there. And I love that you called it the Nate phenomena. Tell us about dear, dear boyfriend, Nate. Right. Nate's the strategy. boyfriend. Nate's the boyfriend. He's played by Adrian Grenier. Uh, Andy, the protagonist here, played by Anne Hathaway. So to recap the story, if you haven't seen the movie and probably seen the movie. Spoiler alerts. Spoiler alerts, right? So, so Andy, Anne Hathaway, she gets a job. She wants to be in journalism, but she takes a job at the fashion magazine that's run by the ostensible villain, Meryl Streep. Uh, you know, channeling Anna Wintour, the, you know, longtime managing editor of Vogue magazine. So Miranda Priestley is her character, the Meryl Streep character. And she's supposedly the villain. She's not the villain. The Meryl Streep character, Miranda, she's the trial. She's the obstacle. She is what Anne Hathaway has to overcome to find success, to find meaning in this career in fashion. The villain is the boyfriend. The villain is Nate. Because Nate comes to her and says, ah, after she finds some success here, you've changed. You're not the sweet girl that I fell in love with. You're colder. You only want to talk about business. Nate breaks up with her. And the tragedy, of course, is that Andy, Anne Hathaway, she internalizes this. She says, you know what? Nate's right. I need to quit my job. I need to find another lesser job so that I can be the old person that I was. And with that, then, she reconnects with Nate. And maybe... They start getting their relationship back on track. Maybe he'll take her back. And then, and only then, can Anne Hathaway's character be happy. Nate's the villain here. Now, here's what I'm saying. I, I, I got to say this, though, before we talk about this anymore. I am so supportive of anyone who wants to make the decisions that the Anne Hathaway character did. I am so in favor of people pursuing what makes them happy. And that can, in fact, mean I'm going to do a different job. I'm going to do no job at all. Success in a professional setting does not is not a prerequisite. It's not a requirement. It's not anything for your personal happiness or life. If you want to make those decisions, I am so supportive of that. But Andy, the Anne Hathaway character, she's a story. She's a constructed story designed to make you like this movie and give money and attention to the owners of this movie. And what I really bugs me is the universality of these messages, these stories that are presented to women, that this is the choice you should make. That's so what that me. The point inside of it that I feel, I feel obligated to say as a lover of narrative and craft is that there's, so it's important that we understand these variables so that when we're encountering a story like this, we see it. We have to see the Nate character and that this forces a different path for the Andy character, for the main character, that the villain might not be where the story is telling you the villain is. And it's important to see that because it's okay to look at a movie like this or a story like this and say, like, I don't like this or I don't like this, the way that this tension resolves. 
And it's okay to like challenge these narratives and these stories and point them out. And the, the redemptive arc inside of this, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not cheating. I'm not trying to get two cultish corners out of this one. But do, do you know who Lauren Weisberger is? Do you know this name? No, no I don't. Okay. No. Okay. It's a, this, my game today is asking if you know names you're not going to be able to say. Lauren nice. Weisberger wrote the book uh, that the movie is then based on, The Devil Wears Prada. Scranton, Pennsylvania. Shout out. She's a few years older than me. Somehow I missed her in the growing up. But um, this is a, a version of an experience that she had. Like the, the coolest risk taker message inside of this is that this person had this crappy experience, turned around and said, well, that was friggin' messed up. Wrote this book. Do you know she's eight books deep? Like you want to talk like an entrepreneurial risk that like should be celebrated is is that real, real life Nate phenomena did not slow Lauren Weisberger down. Yep. Eight books deep. Major motion picture. It's not Wall Street risk, but it's a form of ingenuity that comes out of these things. 100%. And we have to be able to see these stories the way you're unpacking in this piece so that we can see these variables because, and, and say the quote, cause I don't have it in front of me. What's b before you tell us that the answer is more stories. You said it a couple of times in the piece. Sure. You can do it, but you shouldn't, but you shouldn't. And that's become the only story. Yeah. It's, it's fine to, to, to enjoy the movie, the devil wears Prada. It's you great it. to enjoy the movie, but to recognize it's a movie, it's a story. Stepping back, what is interesting to me as an observation is that is the only story that is told today about women risk takers in finance. And it's not a story that's told at all anymore about men in finance. We need more stories because it's human nature to take stories as a model for our own decisions and our own behavior. I want to say, it's fine. It's great to make a real life decision like Andy did, but make it because it's your story, not because you're simply modeling the only set of stories you know. That's why I think we need more stories, more lived experiences by women about women, by men about women, by men about men, by women about men, and all variations and all different scales of menness and womanness you want to use. Right. We just need so many more stories by so many more voices because we use them as models. I want to have as many models from stories as possible. And that's what I think the answer is. And this has been such like the biggest thing I've learned from doing this podcast is this, like I didn't watch that movie and think Nate was the villain. Um, and like, I I'm learning so much about how we are influenced by all this stuff and what's going on behind the scenes. And I think a lot of other people probably are like me in terms of they, they don't know this stuff as well as you do. So hopefully that's something we can, we can get across in this podcast is, you know, as I'm learning about doing this, hopefully some other people are as well in terms of how these things actually impact us. Jack, if we don't make you sob watching the guy bury the dog in margin call <laughs> <laughs> before the holidays, we failed you. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Let, let's, let's take this hard left turn. The zeitgeist. We got to talk about a whole other level of story here. The college presidents went to Congress and they kind of ended up sounding like jerks. Jack, what did we see? And then Ben, you're going to help us break down what we think the strategy was here and what went awry. Yeah. So just, just for some background on this, it was the presidents of Penn, Harvard, and MIT that were called before Congress. And, you know, they gave a lot of testimony, but one of the things they were asked is it was along the lines of whether students would be disciplined for calling for the genocide of Jews. Um, and I guess to put it mildly, they did not give the answer you would hope they would give. Um, they did not give the strong answer you would expect anyone would give in that situation to a question like that. And so, so I guess the first question is, wh why did that happen? I mean, I was looking at that and thinking about like, I mean, these don't seem like horrible human beings, I, I don't think. Like, how did they get to the point that they're in front of Congress and they can't do that? I mean, were they lawyered up or something? I, I just couldn't understand how we got there. Well, that's part of it. So come back to that, the, the lawyered up bit of it. But the, the first part of it, and it's related to the lawyered up part of it, is that you see this happen 
not infrequently, it's when people don't understand the venue. They've prepared themselves for one sort of, I'll call it discourse. They've prepared themselves for one type of conversation, and they are utterly unprepared for the broader conversation. So what I mean by that is that all three of these women presidents were prepared for the questioner, Elise Stefanik, to be coming at them from a right-wing, Trumpy direction. They were bristled up. They were prepared by their PR firms, their, their lawyers, to be very careful when Elise Stefanik is answering you questions. You need to be on your guard because she's going to be asking you questions on this left-right spectrum. She's going to be trying to make points from a Trumpy political perspective. And that's how they were prepared. That's how they were thinking. And that's how they answered. And, oh my God, did they just miss the forest from the trees? Because if you step back from that framing of, oh, here's a Trumpy person who's going to be asking me Trumpy questions, and boy, I hate Trumpiness, so I'm going to be very careful and, you know, disagree with anything she suggests. I'm going to see her as an adversary. It creates the sort of responses we saw, responses that were utterly inhuman, that failed any sort of perspective other than, oh, I've got to get all lawyered up and careful when, you know, this Trumpy congresswoman starts asking me questions. And what is... I mean, for me, like the obvious thing in watching that is these people have to be fired. Um, you know, th that was my first reaction. Like I couldn't see any other reaction to that. I mean, is that, does that make sense in, in this context? I mean, I don't really know. But then I also try to look at things that happen and say, you know, people in front of congressmen who are asking them very difficult questions or in a very highly stressed situation, you know, it, it's a tough thing. Like, how would I react in there? I don't know. I, I kind of tried to balance that with, with my initial reaction, which is that you can't represent these universities anymore after you do that. I think the, the answer to that goes back to not firing, but resignation of political appointees. And what you can be asked to resign, right? The board can ask you to resign. The resignation needs to come from you if you can no longer be effective in your job. My personal view, Jack, and I agree with you, is that none of these university presidents can be effective in their job going forward. That their inability to recognize what was happening here and to respond as any human would respond, disqualifies them, makes them utterly ineffective going forward. Now, this had been going on, I think, for a while in the case of Penn. In the case of Harvard, though, it, it's kind of interesting because what the... I'll call it the university board or the decision-making group, the corporation decided was that Claudine Gay, Claudine Gay can be effective as a representative of the faculty there at Harvard who strongly support her. So the, the view, which I think that the, the story that they have internalized is that what is Harvard? It's the faculty. But that is Harvard. I think that's so wrong-headed and just so myopic and short-sighted and just so wrong. But I think that's the answer to your question, Jack, right? Is that what is the 
how do these leaders see themselves in terms of what is their role? And to answer that question is, well, what is the university? I think the board at Penn answered the question correctly, that the chairman and the president resigned. Not because they think they did anything wrong, and that's fine, but because they recognized that they cannot be effective as leaders of these institutions going forward. I think that's absolutely true with MIT and Harvard. But what we're seeing with Harvard is an internal re an internalization of a narrative that the university is not the students, its place, its alumni, its position in the world, but the university is actually the faculty. We're going to see this play out, and it's going to be really messy, and it's going to be it's going to be a, a, a struggle here. And it's a struggle that I don't think Harvard administrators and faculty are going to win. But we'll see. That's what's going on, I think, Jack. We could, we could do a whole other episode on this because like, what's yeah. going on in college campuses is something that I have a lot of questions about, and particularly why it's going on in what would be considered the most elite universities in the country, more so than it's going on in other universities. But we, we can save that for later because I know Matt's going to push me to ask a less than intelligent question here in a second. Well, but I, I think this is a segue. Jack's dumb question. <laughs> We're thinking about like listening to people that might be viewed as less than authority figures and just like walking into Congress looking for a fight or looking to play like extreme defense. You know, you go in looking for a fight, you're probably going to get one, just might not be in the way that you expected. So you've got a dumb question this week about like listening to voices that somebody might think is dumb or judge you for and admitting that. So Jack, ask, ask yeah, you know, is really not a dumb question at all in my book. Well, one of the things I try to do is I try to listen to people who have opposite opinions and I'm a pretty centrist. So that, that ends up being people on both sides of things. And, you know, but the question is kind of around how do you figure out who is worth listening to and who's not? So I'll give you an extreme example. Like back in the day, Joe Rogan had Alex Jones on. And I was like, when I heard that, I'm like, hell no. I'm like, there's no way I'm listening to this. Like what Alex Jones is so hurt, did is so horrific. I don't care what Alex Jones's opinion is. I don't want to hear about it. Right. But then recently, um, in a much less extreme example, like my, I've mentioned my all in podcast that I do listen to fairly regularly. And, and, and I, I listen to that more so because I learn about like what things like the preference stack are and, you know, things in technology and venture capital that I otherwise would never know about. But anyway, they, they do do a lot of this political stuff and they, they had Tucker Carlson on and. You know, I kind of had a much more muted version of the same reaction, which is like, should I really be listening to Tucker Carlson? And, and so I was just wondering, Ben, like if, if you have ideas around this, like when you think about some of these people who might have very, very different opinions than you, like how do we think about whether I should be listening to them or whether they're maybe not even worth my time? It's a tough one. I think that, um, well, it's a tough one. It's not tough to, to listen to people with different opinions, right? That's, that's not tough. I mean, that's, that's, uh, necessary. It's absolutely necessary. What I believe personally, though, when we're talking about the people such as Alex, jo Alex Jones and Tucker Carlson, uh, as a political candidate, Vivek, um, as I mean, we can kind of go down the list, right? Um, Elon, right? Uh, that on Twitter, you know, got like Jackson Hinkle, right? I mean, with, with we don't have to go through the list of names. That point, the common denominator for you mentioned Tucker and Alex Jones. I don't think they are. Um, I don't think there's an authentic bone in their body. I think that what they are communicating is whatever generates the engagement. I don't think there is a authentic opinion that they're expressing other than a vibe, a feeling of, fuck it, you know, I want to appeal to 
a chaos, a baser urge that gets me the, the dopamine and the adulation and the response that I'm looking for, period. So I'm all for opinions that are different. But it has to be, in my view, coming from an honest broker of that opinion. I do not think that any of the people you mentioned, including the people on the All In podcast, I do not think they are honest brokers of an opinion, either of their own or of others. So that's where I draw the line. Uh, I, you know, I mentioned like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan doesn't bother me, right? I, I, I mean. He's not, he wouldn't be my bud, right? But I, I, I don't think of him as inherently, as an inherently dishonest broker of opinion. So anyway, it's, it's like, you know, Potter Stewart said about, you know, pornography, you kind of know when you see it. For me, what I'm looking for is, is the person an honest broker of opinion? And if they're not, I don't want to listen to him. Yeah. And for me, like Jared Kushner was an example of somebody who was, was on the other side of the line, not from the perspective that like when I listened to Jared Kushner, I necessarily wanted to change my opinion of Jared Kushner, but more, I like learned a lot about what, what's going on in the Middle East and what they did in the Middle East. And, you know, all I learned a lot about that by listening to him. So by like focusing on maybe some of the factual stuff rather than saying, you know, what is my opinion personally of Jared Kushner, you know, that that's one that's a good example of something that benefited me. I think that's a great example. I don't, I do not think of yeah, I don't know these people. I say this is it's an impressionistic thing, right? I don't I don't think of Jared Kushner as a dishonest broker. I can disagree with his opinion, and there are lots of think uh, disagreeable aspects of him, but I don't think of him as a dishonest broker of opinion. Let's jump into our tweet of the week. President Biden is back with a view on inflation. Let's get this tweet up on the screen here, Jack, and uh, tell us what we're seeing from our dear president here. Well, my first question for you guys is, is President Biden really back? Because my belief based on reading this is that he does not write any of his own tweets, but I don't know if you guys agree with that. Oh, I'm sure he doesn't. Of course he doesn't. He's got a department for that. Yeah. So, but what was interesting to me about this is, so like I'm learning about narrative as we go along here. And so I try to, when I see stuff like this, I try to guess now. I'm trying to think about like, how will Ben look at this? Like, how will he view this? And in this case, I was completely wrong, but let, let me read the tweet first. So there's a tweet from Joe Biden that says, let me be clear to any corporation that hasn't brought their prices back down, even as inflation has come down, it's time to stop the price gouging, give American consumers a break. And, you know, we don't have to go into too much about what's wrong with this. I mean, the, the reader context was, you know, as long as the inflation rate is positive, prices are increasing. The fact that inflation has come down to 3.2% in October means that prices are still going up, albeit at a slower rate than before. But my question is, why, why do this? Like, you know, my first re reaction was maybe like the person whoever's writing Joe Biden's tweets just doesn't know how inflation works. So that was my first reaction. And then my next one was maybe they know this is wrong, but they know that it's going to appeal to their base. You know, we're going to go after the corporations. So it's going to be effective for them, even though it's wrong. But it turns out both of those are wrong because, or at least in, in terms of the way you interpreted it, Ben, because what you wrote is, not for the first time, it strikes me that this White House messaging is so bad, so insanely counterproductive to any competent electrical or governing strategy that it must be intent intentional narrative self-sabotage. So my, my idea that this is working in their favor, I guess, was not correct. I, don't know. I, mean, I mean, a little bit of my response was tongue in cheek. I don't think they are actively working to self-sabotage their, their electoral efforts, but I think it does sabotage their electoral efforts. I think it is... Mm. What I think it is, is it's part of, a, of an overall mindset that the electorate is dumb. The electorate is dumb. And that we can say whatever dumb things we want, and it will mold the electorate like clay. And I really do think that's wrong. I think it's, it, it is so, there's an inauthenticity to it. There is a treatment of voters as instruments. There is a, there's a, 
presentation of opinion, not because you actually believe what you're saying, but because you think it will have effects on people. And I think it's so damaging. I think it's so counterproductive. I think it is so obviously inauthentic. It just reeks of, let me choose a talking point that will, you know, have this impact. You just, well, I think that happens a lot, but I think it's actually done in an, in an artful way by Hollywood, for example, and some of the examples we we're giving. Uh, this was so blatantly and, and unartfully done that I think it, it becomes self-sabotage and counterproductive. That was my reaction. So, so my second one was sort of right. I mean, you believe whoever wrote this knew this was not correct. And they believed that it actually would work in their favor, even though they knew it was not correct. They were just wrong about that. Yeah. I, I mean, I think they're wrong about it, right? I think I, they, they thought, oh, this sounds truthy, right? Not, it's not truth, but it sounds truthy. And, you know, people will, you know, respond to it. It's, it's, a, it's an old person's idea of how you should use social media, even though I think it was probably written by a 20-something staffer. There you go. So let's jump into the mailbag. We got a great question uh, from the Epsilon Theory Forum this week. Yep. And there's, there's so many good conversations. If you're at all considering, go to EpsilonTheory.com, check out the subscriptions. The conversations in the forum are second to none. I'm a longstanding member. The people you'll meet and talk to here, yep. just come join us. It's the best 20 bucks a month you'll ever spend. Seriously. So yep. uh, M had a really excellent comment to to Ben to your post. Uh, Jack, do you want to read it? Do you have it up in front of you or can we put it on the screen? Yeah, I can say I, I'll put it up on the screen as well. So um, the, the comment was, so the question for me is not how do we get more women to stick with the career, but rather how do you temper the insane culture of overwork in the sector so that the perceived costs are not so startling high, startlingly high? What I loved about M's post uh, is that it's starting from this place of discussing work, work in finance, work as risk-taking in finance. It starts from the place of the context of femaleness, a woman in Wall Street. And M takes it one step more broadly. Let's put it in the context of being a human being. I love that. Just love that. Because the observations that I was making about narrative around women on Wall Street, that's one thing. There are elements of that. But, you know, Matt, you mentioned this earlier. Let's talk about women in other fields as well. What Em is saying, all right, let's talk about men and women in Wall Street. I just love that so much, right? Because what, I think that, that what also bugs me, right, is, is that it wasn't just that there's this universal portrayal of you can do it, but you shouldn't about women, it was that that's disappeared as a conversation to have about men. We should be talking about men and women. You can do it, but should you? Because, look, you guys, you've been in this business as, as well as me. There is absolutely a soul-destroying dimension to managing other people's money for profit. There absolutely is. It's only one story, right? It's not the story as it's being presented for women. But it is a story. And it's something we need to grapple. We need to model. We need to talk about. 
for all of us, men and women, as human beings. In finance and in every other industry you want to name. So I was so excited for M's comment because it's what I hope the forum, what I hope this podcast, what it can be, it's, it's a seed. It's a seed for real people to talk with each other about the issues of our lives, not to be talked at by men to women, not to be talked at by, you know, big media or Hollywood or big politics, but for us to talk about our own lived experiences and how we make it better, if not for ourselves, for our children. Anyway, that it's that sort of comments that I'm just so proud of that we've been able to uh, encourage in the forum. And I think that we can encourage it everywhere to have exactly those kind of broader conversations. And I will say as someone who's, you know, didn't read the forums as much until we did this, like they're really, really good. I and mean, there's so many, you know, when you, when you talk about forums on the internet, like you can go to some sites and it's a complete catastrophe, yeah. but like the, your, your it's forum successful. is so like, it's, it's thoughtful, like really, you know, people like looking at both sides and it, it's really, really good. You know, what does it Jack is that we charge money. That is true. Yeah. I, I mean, I could not be more serious. It's the way to get rid of trolls and most of the way to improve the uh, the commentariat, right, is it costs you twenty bucks a month. So it's it's um it's amazing how that works. It's amazing. So Matt, it is it's time to pivot. It's time to bring the joy and the happiness to uh to nice. wrap up the episode here. Go ahead. Um, what have you got in the cultish corner this week? Okay, so I promised another another random name to see if you know. And you might know this one because this has been a little bit more in pop culture lately. Uh, do you guys know the name Ruth Handler? I do not. Yeah, you're asking these pop culture. They, I mean, just, you're just think, embarrassing us here, man. I think my ratio is, is literally zero and every person Max ever asked about on this, like ever knowing who it is. I, I promise you know who this person is. And this is one that I would have not have known by name if I didn't totally get sucked down this rabbit hole. But I think it's so important because this goes back to the idea of talking about there's the story as it's presented us, but the better we are at reading and understanding and taking in story, the more we can figure out the story that we actually want to retell or pass forward. And that doesn't have to be the story that's presented to us. We can retell the Devil Wears Prada and point out the Nate phenomena like you did, Ben. And I think it's, that's the power of studying narrative. So. So Ruth Handler is an ultimate risk taker and I think really deserves to be celebrated at a level that we have not yet celebrated this woman because, so Ruth Handler is the creator of Barbie. She names Barbie after her daughter, Barbara, the famous idea, her and her husband have this furniture business. They're using plastics and they go on this European trip. She sees these dolls. She looks at her kids and she's like, Hey, you know what? Baby dolls and little girls, like, why do they just have to play mommy? Let's have a new narrative that's not just about playing mommy and let's, let's make a store. And in the great tradition of women in business, what does she do? She, she goes to her husband and she talks us over. They get this, this, this business partner, middle name, uh, or name Matson, nicknamed Matt and Elliot, Ruth Handler's husband and Matson form a little company you might've heard of called Mattel. Ruth's name, not, not in Mattel. Not anywhere. in there. Yeah. 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 But Barbie becomes the flagship product. I think 1959, it just goes crazy. And again, this redefines the sixties. This is part of the, uh, the second wave of feminism, this, this revolution of again, like little girls, not just playing mommy. What often gets overlooked or people then don't know by not even knowing risk taker Ruth by her name is that in the 70s, she gets breast cancer. And while that takes her out of the focus on her business, there's this whole SEC investigation, all this stuff debatably gets like pushed onto her. 
while she's struggling with a mastectomy and everything she goes through. And she ends up ousted from the business. And this matters too, because real risk takers get upside and downside. Ruth got forced out of the business after a mastectomy and breast cancer in the 70s. Paid some fines, did a lot of community service. That's a whole other thing you can read on if you want. But she got pushed out. And when she got pushed out, do you guys know what she did after, like after Barbie? Have, do, are you aware of this part of the story? Nope. I'm not. This is really important. No Nate phenomena here. Because she doesn't go small again. So the mastectomy, the loss of confidence, she actually goes on to make the first lifelike prosthetic breast. Like she's the first one to do this wow. for cancer survivors. And so she couldn't do Barbies anymore. It was no longer about her daughters. It was time to make from something for her friends, for the other survivors. And so old risk taker Ruth, she goes and she builds a business. She got up again. And, you know, by the, by the mid to late seventies, first lady Betty Ford ends up being fitted with one of these prosthetics. That company goes on to get sold to Kimberly Clark in the 90s. She did this on her terms. So if you watch the Barbie movie, uh, Ruth Handler does make an appearance. She's kind of like the spirit guide in this movie and she makes this thing and there's some, there's some gestures, but it's this idea. You have to gather these good stories. You have to unpack them and find the ways to reserve them because l life, that's the finite part possibility that's the infinite part and when we talk about risk it's the infinite possibility in celebrating the stories of the people who take it that's an awesome story i literally didn't know anything about any of that love it matt thanks thank you for that that is so important so matt i'm thinking you probably have some notes i got notes <laughs> so let's summarize this and bring this let's bring this ship in here so Another great episode. Thank you guys. Really enjoy this. Make sure you like, follow, subscribe, all the things. But here's what we talked about today. We talked about risk takers. And I really love this idea of you put risk on in the real world for profit. And just like the Ruth Handler story, the way we tell these stories matters because it actually determines what we model our life after. Do we want to model our life after a 60s plastic doll or somebody who invented that doll? made a prosthetic for cancer survivors, did all these also pretty notable and amazing things. Those stories matter because it's the power of seeing, and Ben, you brought this out, the, the literal risk takers of all types. There's a power in their visibility. And that's what we see this flip happen of some risk taking to a different way of looking at it in the visibility of those risk takers as they're depicted and the notable absence of female risk takers who stay in the game, for lack of a better word. Inside of this too, it's important that we see the villains in order to find the heroes. And it's, it's not just the heroes we want, it's the heroes we need. Because it's okay for Andy and a Devil Wears Prada to choose happy, that's okay. But it's also Laura Weissenberger choosing to like go and write the book and be the risk taker on the other side. The villains aren't always who we think they are and neither are the heroes, but we get to see those out. When we talked about the college situation and the college presidents, if you walk in looking for a fight, you're going to get one in one way or the other. And that adversar adversarial stance, that can disqualify you from something that requires you not to be adversarial. It's an important point. Uh, who to listen to and who not to listen to. Point number one, listening is always necessary. Ben, you raised that point. I think that's super important. But number two is to seek authenticity. And Jack, this was my big takeaway from, from that question in this conversation. Looking for this honest broker of opinion idea in someone who you won't, don't want to judge as a character, to use the story language, but you want to judge them by their character, by what, that, by what they show over time in their actions. And then M in the question about the cult of work and the context of not just being a human, but a human being and being a full hearted one, one who takes risks for progress without selling our souls. Because if we're going to invest all this time enjoying the cult of work, how do we not sell out to that? 
And I think this is where I want to land this. And it was the point you made about this, Ben. It's this idea of plant a seed and sell a seed. Sure, make your profit, do your thing. But planting the seed is to take a risk. It's to put it in the ground and see if you can grow something. And if you can't, the, the whole point is to help someone else do the same. You grow the plant and you have a new seed, you have a new harvest and now help someone else plant it. And when we're talking about narrative in this way, we're talking about stories as seeds. And that's a really powerful metaphor here because there's one thing we're trying to do. It's to plant that seed, grow that tree, harvest that seed and help somebody else do the same thing, make a positive difference in this world. Thanks for joining me, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Well done as always. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe wherever you're watching breaking news so more people can find our show. If you know another clear-eyed and full-hearted individual, why not share this episode with them too? Like we said at the top, the media is making us tick, and it's our job to talk. Follow the headlines at fiatnews.com. Follow Ben at epsilontheory.com and at Epsilon Theory on Twitter. Follow Jack at validiacapital.com and at practicalquant on Twitter. Follow Matt at sunpointinvestments.com, cultishcreative.com, and at cultishcreative on Twitter.